Vladimir is an expert council member of the Russian Senate Foreign Relations Committee, a professor of the Academy of Military Science, a former high-ranking ranking diplomat, leading expert on disarmament and strategic stability issues, key issues in arms control today and tomorrow between Moscow and Washington. That's his, the title of his talk. We're really pleased to have you here, Vladimir. Thank you for coming and uh, really looking forward to, to what you have to Thank say. Thank you very Thank much you. for your introduction, Thank dear ladies and gentlemen. Good morning again to all of you. I'm happy again to see you here. Uh, several years ago, uh, they was right that we met before uh, in Kiruna, Sweden. But the subject hasn't changed. <coughs> much more or worse that it has been uh, in the most dangerous situation nowadays. Please, next slide. Unfortunately, the US uh, government has displayed and still is displaying negative attitude towards 12 arms control treaties. If I look through all this stuff I made in Russian and in English, new start actually two major violations but the most uh, uh, terrific violations are related to the INF treaty the US government will pull back from that treaty entirely very soon on the 2nd of August this year I will later on come back to the INF treaty violations because you will be as I can imagine surprised too much 117, mamma mia, incredible. Vladimir, could you speak a little louder? Louder, okay, I will do. Open Skies Treaty, actually two violations. NPT, two violations. Chemical Warfare Convention, violations. Uh, Iranian nuclear program, also withdrawal, withdrawal. ABM Treaty, withdrawal. CTBT, no ratification, no chances even to ratify it, you know. CFE 1 Alpha no ratification, European Security Treaty uh, and uh, 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 Treaty on Prevention of Arms Race in Outer Space, also refusal to debate even. And the last one, in C, Incidents at Sea Prevention Agreement, refusal to debate. You probably could add 13 uh, agreement, like uh, on weapon grade plutonium. Next slide, please. So, there are several formidable threats as we see them from Moscow currently. It's the deployment of the U.S. nuclear weapons and their delivery systems, you know. Unilateral withdrawal of the United States from the INF and the New START treaties. START treaty or New START or START 3 as we put it is also in danger. Uh, intensive flights of the U.S. strategic heavy bombers over Europe and near Russian territory. From 2014, uh, the U.S. strategic command began regular patrolling of uh, the airspace near the Russian uh, European uh, part of, of the country, uh, near the Baltic states and over the Baltic Sea and fielding of the U.S. ground-based and sea-based missile defense assets. In Romania it's open, it's operational. In Poland it's, it has slightly moved into 2020 instead of uh, 2018, but nevertheless construction is underway. And uh, dual-capable aircraft, DCA, of NATO in the Baltic airspace, embracing Lithuania, Latvia and Estonia. An increased number of uh, NATO conventional forces, including rapid reaction forces. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a book of mine we specifically issued on the 30th anniversary of the INF Treaty, in Russian and in English. This is English version. Next slide, please. Uh, this is the chapter uh, graphic uh, presentation uh, of 117 U.S. violations of the INF Treaty. Well, I would like to make a short comment that by using INF, the United States wanted to uh, persuade or persuade Russia to scrap ICBM <coughs> like this. 
<coughs> which has nothing to do with the INF completely because they are covered by star treaties, strategic offensive arms. They also wanted to um, destroy this kind of operational missile, which is also lower than 500, uh, 500 kilometers, a minimum starting point covering uh, INF. The reasons why they are doing this is partly like this, to create a new medium range ground launch cruise missile X experimental in Europe or in Asia and medium range uh, uh, ASTM. So next slide please. This is uh, uh, the last, uh, the latest, uh, the latest uh, uh, target of uh, of accusation of Moscow from Washington that allegedly ground launched cruise missiles uh, 9M729 uh, uh, is allegedly a violation, but it is not because uh, maximum uh, flying range is uh, 480 kilometers, less than 500. But on the other side, the United States has six types of the INF test missiles used in testing of the efficiency of the global BMDS. And they are listed here in the green box, all of them. Next slide, please. And this is uh, a presentation of the Russian uh, Minister of Defense and the Russian uh, Foreign Ministry. Uh, in the outskirts of Moscow in Kubinka, the, the missile that I have numerated, like uh, 729. Next slide, please. This is uh, very important to understand. While Russia has violated INF Treaty 000 in terms of flight tests and in terms of test missiles, but at the same time, the United States, exactly from the 2nd of October 1999, Till the current year, they have already conducted 108 flight tests where INF test missiles have been used. And they used much more missiles during this uh, flight test because in a number of cases they wanted to intercept not only one missile <coughs> but a cluster of test missiles maximum five. That's why this figure is a little bit higher than this one. Uh, the sources are here, all official. It's not uh, from any uh, article or any um, internet edition. So next slide, please. This is the first source of information. It's a screenshot of the missile defense agency, a part of a, the Pentagon structure. Uh, the recent one covering uh, event December 11th last year. Look, intermediate range ballistic missile target was intercepted. So for us it's important not this one that uh, interceptors were used because we know that they're uh, widely used and uh, during exercises. But for the Russian side it was a revelation uh, here. Next slide, please. This is the second source of official information, the famous Congressional Research Service. The latest, February 6 this year, they have Appendix A entitled Aegis BMD flight tests. The same figures, attempts, etc. Too many pages, roughly 30 pages of the coverage. Next slide, please. Open sources. In the internet you can find them. What, will, uh, what does it mean that if the United States uh, uh, leave the INF Treaty for good in next uh, uh, August? Military and political implications. You will see, that's my, my understanding, you will see them uh, all, please read them as quickly as you can. By the way, these uh, PPT slides are not classified. They are open. And please share, Bruce, with anybody of your company, of your friends, if you so desire. Absolutely free. They are in the computer, in your computer, not mine. <laughs> Next slide, please. 
Uh, major aims of the United States, uh, uh, which they are seeking by uh, saying goodbye to the INF Treaty, all of them are listed here. Sometimes they are, uh, they have a direct bearing, and sometimes indirect bearing. For example, to increase expenditures uh, into NATO military budgets, persuading uh, allies uh, in the uh, transatlantic community to increase uh, military expenditures uh, not only uh, by 2% in terms of GDP by the year 2024, but up to 4%. This figure I've heard from the last year NATO summit uh, held in Brussels, 4%. But it was uh, Mr. Trump's idea, but it was not stamped or agreed by the entire transatlantic community. Uh, next uh, slide, please. This is the la latest edition. I have not brought to you because it's too heavy. 1,000 uh, pages and more, weighing one kilogram and 200 grams. I'm uh, struggling to translate this edition into English. It's a tremendous job. You can imagine it's much more harder than to present it in Russian. To produce it in Russian. It's available. It's available. It covers, the title is Evolution of the U.S. Strategic and Tactical Nuclear Weapons and specific Specifics of Their Employment in the 21st Century, covering the current period and future. And future. Not the last century. Uh, because everything has been already described, too many editions, too many publications. Uh, this, uh, next slide please, this edition is uh, widely used uh, by uh, Russian expert community and by Russian military and political leaders. So, uh, the core of my uh, discussion in the book I have already displayed it's a creation of the new U.S. strategic nuclear triad. It's not a modernization, I should stress. It's a real new triad of the United States, replacing the existing uh, nuclear strategic triad. So, very soon, very soon, there will be a long-range strategic bomber, 21 Raider, then ground-based strategic deterrent, preliminary uh, title is Minuteman 4, and SSBN of Project 826 Columbia on watch 2031. So it will be a huge inventory. And when I heard yesterday that uh, Mr. Donald Trump, Trump articulated via media an intention to avoid nuclear weapons by three countries, the, the United States, the Russian Federation and the PRC, People's Republic of China, I was very much surprised because it's a huge contradiction. A lot of money will be spent. This is 1 trillion, 200 billion US dollars in constant prices within 30 years. And this is due to inflation rate. So how can I accommodate his recent statement on scrapping nukes forever for good and creating new strategic nuclear triad, which will survive till the end of the century. Next slide, please. This is another uh, book uh, in English uh, covering U.S. tactical nuclear weapons uh, with a question, reduction or modernization? No reduction. Modernization, yes. yes. Exclamation mark. And next slide. It has already been released. So this is a new gimmick, a bomb 61 uh, 12, it will appear in Europe as well and in Asia. And it's a US bomb. bomb. We do not have such thing. Uh, it has a low yield, by the way, 0 0.3 kilotons that can be used in regional conflicts. I identified 14 reasons for using nuclear weapons in the current nuclear posture review signed by the current U.S. administration. 
and we have just in, for the sake of comparison only two cases of using nuclear weapons next slide please well this is the picture that says that it is not Russia which is engulfing Europe but vice versa NATO and US uh, military assets are near our doorsteps uh, tactical weapons in this uh, red boxes then delivery systems uh, F-35 then uh, Aegis uh, sea-based missiles then early warning radars in Varda and Thule and Filingdales etc ships etc it's quite a big stock next slide please uh, I have already told you that uh, DCA, dual capable aircraft for, from 15 uh, NATO members, are involved in the operation called Baltic Air Policing, started in March uh, 2014, 15 years ago. Still goes on. This are uh, Air Force bases in three Baltic nations. In addition to uh, tactical nuclear weapons, we are very much concerned that uh, U.S. Uh, heavy strategic bombers can use this Air Force base uh, called Emery, Emery in Estonia, in Estonia. So landing strip is, is quite uh, uh, sufficient to uh, accept this kind of bombers. And they are operating 24 hours a day and night and day in day out throughout the entire year so by the way six u.s bombers have uh, already settled in firing in uh, fairfort air force base in the united kingdom next slide please assessment of the situation rather gloomy very dangerous very unlucky for all of us look it's undisputable fact that the last century was a nuclear arms race age yes does it is it continuous oh yes it's continuous nine nuclear weapon states the fact in the jury but the most important thing is for us that the current century it could be also labeled as missile defense arms race because it's unlimited after the uh, denunciation of the ABM treaty by the United States and it could be also space-based weapons arms race it's inevitable and there are no obstacles there are no uh, barriers and route to this two additional arms arms races so it would be a combination of a triple arms races in 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 the world and around the globe nuclear arms reductions process has stalled no hopes for resumption of any dialogue last year by the way we sent official note to the US government by urging them to resubscribe again to the notion that Mr. Michael Gorbachev, Mikhail Gorbachev, sorry, and Ronald Reagan once upon a time unveiled to the general public nuclear war cannot be uh, fought because it will never be won. We wanted to reiterate this formula in official declaration with the Trump administration between Trump and Putin. No reaction. We also wanted to resume uh, an old-fashioned Soviet suggestion to subscribe to no first use of nuclear weapons. Again, no desire. Mr. David Trachtenberg from the State Department said that we are not going to subscribe to uh, no first use because allies, our allies, American allies, will be upset that we will not help them in case of emergency. That was an explanation. So, and chances of employment of nuclear weapons have radically increased. And the Cold War III 
point zero is inevitable. Currently, it's my personal opinion that there is a Cold War 2.0 because Cold War 1.0 has already passed, I mean, as a, as a phase. But Cold War never ceased to be completely. It's in the process with the zigzags, with the rocks and shoals, but nevertheless, it still goes on. It's very bad. Next slide, please. So, what is the difference between uh, Cold War 1 and 2 described here? You can read them. Mm -hmm. All right, clear. Next slide, please. Uh, I, for the case, for the sake of uh, uh, self-advertisement, I m made a chapter. It uh, appeared in German. Uh, the new Cold War and preplanned escalation of the U.S. and European conflict with Russia, uh, published in in Vienna uh, this year. Next slide, please. So practical suggestions, the most important part of any intervention. No first use is the most easiest way to do it. It requires, it will require no money, no destruction, if somebody is afraid of destruction. It's a confidence building measure. And I think that it can be uh, it's attainable. It can be reached very quickly, provided there is a good will. There is a good will, but there is no good will. By the way, we have a very imp made uh, we uh, Washington and Moscow. We made a very important step in mid uh, 90s when we uh, signed uh, bilateral agreements on detargeting our nuclear missiles on each other respective territories. Where they are targeted? They are targeted to the world oceans. It's CBM. It has setbacks, unverifiable. And second setback, it can be reversed very easily. Reprogramming. But nevertheless, we have made a step forward, initial. Why not to make uh, the second step? No first use. The whole world will applaud. No doubt. Second, uh, limiting a total number of strategic ballistic missile defense. Once we had the experience in this field you know, within in the framework of the ABM treaty. Currently, with the exception of Patriot, Patriot missile, Yes, um, working both for as ABM and uh, anti-aircraft defense. The United States have already approaching to the ceiling of 2,000 strategic interceptors. And we have, by the way, how many, how many uh, strategic uh, nuclear warheads currently under the new start? 1,000? 550 missiles, ma'am. And in terms of delivery systems, 80, 800. In terms of operationally deployed and non-operationally deployed. So it's approaching. And the formula will be uh, rather awkward. When uh, ballistic missile defense, defensive weapon, will surpass uh, defensive, uh, uh, offensive weapon. Strategic offensive arms. So, so explain, explain the purpose of the BMD in this in this uh, particular case. Okay, the purpose of the of BMD is uh, one is rational, and the other hand is irrational. Rational simply because all BMDs assets are supposed to intercept incoming nuclear missiles. Oh conventional missiles as well. <coughs> Limiting the territory of your own country, for example, right? But the problem with uh, ballistic missile defense is that in the same uh, silos, you can load both interceptors 
a defensive weapon and an offensive weapon in terms of uh, cruise missiles, for example, Kamahawk. Because those silos are universal. They are called MK41. MK They're universal. So defensive and uh, offensive weapons can be housed very easily. The difference is one millimeter per each side, two millimeters altogether. But the silos, the diameter is much wider than the missile itself to uh, help escaping gases to, uh, to uh, evaporate, right? So the problem with the BMDS is that the US BMDS is very close to our shores very close to our land from land masses from Romania and Poland and from adjacent seas and uh, world oceans. My remark in this case is the following, that currently the United States Navy has uh, 37 or probably 38 ships like this, each is capable. Uh, they are uh, destroyers uh, of early Berg project and cruisers, Ticonderoga class uh, uh, ships, vessels. When the US uh, combat ships shipbuilding program will be <coughs> over uh, the, at the beginning of uh, 2040, something like that, 41 or 42, uh, the US Navy will have either 84 Aegis capable ships or even 96 as a maximum. So how much is that? It's roughly one third of the entire US Navy in that period of time. And so they, I mean, Aegis uh, uh, sea-based systems can sail everywhere in the world oceans without any restrictions, provided they are sailing beyond territorial waters. So no permission is required. That's why 90%, 95% of the entire uh, Aegis uh, interceptors will go into the world oceans rather than stay on the continental USA, that will be also increased, and partly in Europe, like in Romania and uh, Poland. So, uh, strategic or tactical uh, aircraft should be limited. I mean, the day and night patrolling, it's not necessary in peacetime. In the wartime, I can imagine everything. But in the peacetime, it's uh, irrelevant. Patrolling with the bombs, with the nuclear-tipped uh, missiles, etc., very close to, to Europe or to uh, or Asia or to Russia, and there uh, should be a new conventional forces treaty. One yes, you, yeah, please do. About the limitations. Yes. What is going to limit this number? I okay, yeah, yeah, sure. yeah. Okay, yes. Right you are, right you are. What do I mean? I mean to limit the total number of strategic interceptors. Under start? No, okay. separate. Ah. Separate. Ah. Separate. Like in the ABM Treaty. Ah, yeah. The ABM Treaty that is, is not alive anymore since uh, 2002. Uh, they had, actually we had, uh, Soviet Union and the United States, uh, 200 strategic interceptors per each side, 200. But later on the protocol of 1974, we both reduced it by 100 per each side. It was very clever, uh, well, idea. Why? Well, simply because 100 interceptors will never intercept 6,000 strategic nuclear warheads from each side on the START-1 treaty. Mm -hmm. But it's the same situation with the United States and with the Soviet Union at the time. So that's why a strategic parity, strategic equilibrium was maintained and guaranteed. But there is another, a U-turn, when the number of interceptors will exceed the number of existing strategic offensive arms, mm -hmm. and it's very dangerous. The temptation will be to attack your adversary by first use attack, first uh, strike. Uh, strikes, yes, right, strike, and then protect your territory by using this 
a great number of uh, strategic uh, defensive interceptors. Shield. Yes, it's a shield. Yes, right. A roof. As you you use shield, NATO use roof. Roof. It's all the same. You have a, a remark, a please. Question. Yeah, please um, do. So that the interception of the of, of the missile does not trigger detonation of the weapon. Uh, have, which so weapon? That, Incoming that missiles? Yeah. Yes, it can it can detonate any so, incoming. So yeah, yeah, why not? Anyway. Yeah, yes, right, right, because right. You have all this fallout in the yeah, yes, right. Ra radioactivity, uh, radioactivity contamination, radioactive contamination, fallout, debris, etc., etc. So, a lot of uh, bad things. So, and uh, bilateral treaty banning space based striking weapons in outer space is uh, latest number five. Currently, uh, no restrictions at all. The only restrictions is that under international agreements, uh, the entire globe doesn't have any right to deploy weapons of mass destruction in outer space, nuclear, chemical, and biological weapons. But all the rest, please go ahead. Next slide, please. Food for thought. If the, the, w there are obstacles and route to uh, sign any agreement between the Russian Federation and the United States, why not to sign the agreement between Russia and Europe separately? Yeah. Yeah. Separately, we can. Why not? Because Europeans are always hostages of ill wishes mm. of other nations. Next slide, please. And I'm finishing. That's all my uh, monographs. Articles are deleted from here, more than 450. <laughs> so uh, even one uh, monograph was uh, translated into Chinese. I'm very proud of that. <laughs> and some of them in English you can see. You go. So thank you very much. Good luck. Good luck. Good luck. See you. Thank see you. you. And bon voyage.